Our scripture reading will be once again on 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 to 17. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from which whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped with every good work. That is a reading of the Word of God. Amen. Now, this morning, we'll be looking at the purpose of the Bible. In other words, why do we actually have the Bible? We've now looked at how the Bible was inspired, how the Bible was preserved, and this morning specifically, we'll now look at why do we actually have the Bible? In other words, why did God give us His most holy word in the form of the book we call the Bible? You see, in our text this morning, we see that Timothy is challenged by the Apostle Paul to maintain a close relationship with the word of God. In other words, Paul tells him of the various benefits of that relationship with the word of God. You see, he's reminded that it is the Scriptures that has taught him to know who God is. It is also the Scriptures that taught him the mind and the heart and the plans of God. You see, it is the Word of God that has fed him and also led him up to that point in his life. So the Scripture has been foundational in making Timothy the godly man that he has become. If it were not for God's Word, he would not have been nearly the man that he became as a result of having that close relationship with the Word of God. So now Paul is telling him he must continue in his relationship with the Word of God. He must not let it fall to the wayside or neglect it or let it gather dust. He must maintain his close relationship with the Bible. He must continue to be fed and led by God's Word so that he can continue to progress as a believer and also as a man of God. You see, you and I also need the Bible in our lives. We need the Scriptures in our lives. If we are going to be all we can be, and not for our own glory or our own sakes or because we are cute or something, but for the glory of God and honoring His name, we need the Scriptures. We need to maintain a close relationship with the Bible. It doesn't help we say God is silent, but our Bible is lying on the desk gathering dust. We can't say God is not near when our Bibles remain closed. We have to maintain a close relationship with the Word of God. If we are going to grow in the Lord and really become everything He has made us to be and everything He desires us to be, then we must actually also grow in our relationship with His Word. We must study it, meditate on it. We must dig in to actually understand it. You see, the verses we have before us this morning also now have something to say about the purpose of the Bible, about the purpose of the Holy Scriptures. You see, they answer at least partially the question of why did God give us the Bible? What was his intention in giving us his word? You see, why did God need to actually give his revelation to those original authors of the Bible? Those people who wrote the original autographs, as we call them. Why did God feel the need to exert his supernatural and divine power to inspire his word? Also, why has he demonstrated that same supernatural power as we spoke about last week? in preserving his Bible. You see, well, I'll never try to or presume to speak for God, because that is something I definitely cannot do. I believe we can dig into his word and find the answers to all these questions and also find the answer as to why did God actually give us his word. So let's take a few moments this morning and examine that specific idea. Why did God give us the Holy Scriptures? Why did He give us 
his Bible. You see, firstly, the Bible serves the purpose of revelation. That is the very first purpose of the Bible. It actually serves the purpose of revelation. You see, if you remember, revelation is that process of God actually telling the authors, those original authors, exactly what He wanted them to write down, what He wanted them to say. But, just as God revealed His Word to those original authors, if you remember, through His Word, He is still today revealing Himself, revealing His heart, revealing His mind, revealing His plan of salvation. And we call that process illumination. You see, and it is this process of illumination which Timothy had already experienced. And according to Paul, in these verses 40 to 15, that is what Timothy experienced. But also notice what the Bible reveals about God Himself. You see, the Bible reveals God's person. So these scriptures reveal God's person. The only way for any of us to know God and the only way for God to be known by us is through His Bible, especially nowadays. We need His Word to actually know who God is, what His mind is, what His heart is, what His plan is, who His Son is, who the Holy Spirit is. We need the Word of God. You see, the Scriptures reveal God as a person to be holy, to be just, to be eternal, to be glorious, to be exalted, to be loving, to be gracious, to be merciful and infinitely good. And those are just some of the words we can use to describe God. I don't think we have the vocabulary as human beings to really describe the fullness and glory and love of God. I mean, if you just think about it, God came down to sacrifice Himself for us. And yet, none of us deserve it. We can never fathom just how great a God we serve. And you see, the Scriptures also teach us He is Lord. He is sovereign. He is fully in control of everything. Fully in control of every single thing. But now, people make the mistake. They just portray God as loving, but they forget God has two sides. Yes, He is loving, but He is also a righteous judge. So God is a consuming fire, but He can also be terrible and wrathful. Not just loving, but He is righteous when He is wrathful and when He is an all-consuming fire. You see, in the Bible, we learn one truth. Man can never by himself have come to God. That is not possible. You see, in the pages of the Bible, we meet God Himself. We meet Him. We could no, never know God very well in any other way. If we did not have the Bible, we would not have known God. The Bible is actually a precious book, a very precious book. But now also, the Scriptures reveal God's power. You see, in the pages of Scripture, we read of the awesome power of God. We can read of His power to create. Genesis chapters 1 and 2. We also read about it in Isaiah 40 verse 12. We also read of His power in impossible situations, in truly impossible situations. Just think of John 11 and John 6. The feeding of the 5,000 and where you find Jesus calming the storm, walking on water. God has power in all these impossible situations. Nothing is impossible for God. What's impossible for us is never impossible for God. It's always possible for Him. We also read of His power to heal. But then we also read of His power to do anything that He desires to do. That is like in Luke 1, verse 38, Job 42, verse 4, and Ephesians 3, verse 20. But another thing that is revealed is it reveals God's promises. If you open the Bible and try to count all the promises of God, you'll be kept busy for quite a while. There are thousands upon thousands of promises that fill the pages of the Word of God. It's a book packed with promises from God. And every single one either has already been fulfilled and kept, 
or will be kept. He will never forsake you on His promises. Romans 4, verse 21. Also the saints of God, which is us as believers, never need to fear that any of God's promises will fail. He cannot fail and will not fail in His promises. He will always keep it. He is true to His word. Because if you remember, God cannot lie. So not a single promise is a lie, and every single promise will come true. You see, everything that God does is for the glory of His name. And God does nothing that does not exalt Him. He will never do anything if it does not bring Him honor and glory or exalt Him ever. Okay, but we are also told what is interesting. He has exalted His word above His very own name. Psalm 138, verse 2. So His word is more important to God than His actual name. And yet His name is more important also than anything. Just to give an idea of how important God's word truly is to Him. That we take it up, read it, meditate on it, and apply it. Another thing is, they reveal God's plan. If you think about it, how would we have known the gospel? about God's plan of salvation, about Jesus Christ. All the eyewitnesses have passed away. How would we have known if it were not for the writings contained in the Bible? So they reveal the plan of salvation. You see, in God's inspired, infallible, inerrant, perfect, complete, and preserved word, we read His plan to save the sinner. Romans 5, verse 8, Romans 10, verse 13, but we also read about how he aims to satisfy the saints. Psalm 103, verse 5, secure the saved. John 10, verse 28, John 6, verses 37 to 40, but also to supply his children in their needs. Philippians 4, verse 19, and Psalms 37, verse 25. So that's just revealing God's person and power and promises and plan. But another thing and another purpose that the Word of God serves is it serves the purpose of redemption. So the Bible serves this purpose of redemption. You see, the Bible is an unfolding story of redemption. You can start at Genesis and end at Revelation. It is one story. It has a single golden thread running through all of those stories. So it's actually one complete, perfect story. You see, verse 50 reminds us also that the Scriptures are able, and I'll quote from the King James, able to make thee wise unto salvation. You see, so the Scriptures actually give us the wisdom and knowledge of salvation and God's plan of redemption. So from the ma moment that man sinned in the Garden of Eden, you'll find that continuous story where God promised there will be a Savior whose heel will be bitten, but it will crush the head of the serpent, right? So Jesus was already promised from the beginning because God declares the end from the beginning. So it's one continuous story right through the Bible. And you see the story of redemption then culminates in Christ's crucifixion. That is the culmination of the story of redemption. You see, but now it also demonstrates the wickedness of the sinner. You see, the Bible is what teaches us that we are sinners and in need, desperate need of a Savior. That you will read in Romans 3 verse 10, 3 verse 23, and also Galatians 3 verse 22. But also, the Scriptures demonstrate the wrath of the sovereign God. Romans 6 verse 23, John 3 verse 18 and 36. But also what they demonstrate is that the soul has worth. God would not have died for us if our souls did not have worth, if we ourselves did not have any worth. So the soul has worth. 2 Peter 3 verse 9 as well as John 3 verse 16. And then another thing that it also demonstrates is it demonstrates the way of salvation. It is through the Scriptures, through reading and digging into the Word of God that we learn what the gospel is, how it applies to us, and how we can be saved, and how we can build our relationship with God Himself. 
Then another thing that the Bible does, the third and final thing the Bible does, is it serves the purpose of reinforcement. So verses 16 and 17 speaks of these benefits that can be derived from a careful and close study of the Word of God, a careful and close study of the Bible. So after we have received God's revelation, we've read His plan, we're now part of His redemptive plan, the Bible now serves as a reinforcement tool. So in other words, it helps us to grow and develop in all the areas and aspects that God wants His children to be grown in and developed in. So I want to point out now two ways that Scripture can actually help us develop and grow. So firstly, the Scriptures build us up through their standards. We must always remember, we are not to live according to our own standards or according to man-made standards and norms, but according to the standards laid out by God in His Word. So one of the criticisms, especially against the Bible, by those who reject our faith and the Word of God, is that the Bible is just a book filled with rules. But you see, the Bible is much more than just a book filled with rules. In fact, it is the guidelines for living that are contained within the Bible that actually enable us to live lives that do bring glory and honor to God and exalt His name. Because we oftentimes will be in this world the only Bible unbelievers will ever read. So the way we act and react is also an indication of whether we're living up to God's standards as contained in His Word. So you see, Jesus said that keeping His commandments was a tangible evidence that we actually love Him. Keeping His commandments is a tangible evidence that we love Him. Now remember, that is not the Old Testament law, it is the law of the Messiah as He laid down. We're no longer under the curse of the law, we have the liberty from Christ. But we read in John 14, 15. But then Jesus tells us that obeying God, the Word of God, is an also proof of our salvation. 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 to 6, and 1 John chapter 4, verse 6. But John also says that the commandments of the Lord will not be harsh to the believer. In fact, as believers, His commands will be a delight to our heart. We will not find it burdensome or cumbersome. It will be a delight to our heart. We will want to love people and pray for our enemies and even help those who persecute us and speak well of them because we serve God. And it's a delight to serve God. It is not a burden. You see, those who are determined to live out the commands and teachings of the Bible will grow. That is when you will grow. But now, when it comes to these rules and the commands, don't get hung up by all the don'ts in the book. You see, if you focus on all the things you must do, you won't have time or energy to spend on the don'ts. So don't focus too much on the don'ts. Focus on doing the do's, and you'll be fine. Okay. Then, another thing they do as they serve this purpose of reinforcement is they build us up through all their different symbols that are contained within these pages. You see, the Bible identifies itself through several clear metaphors and similes. Sorry, you see, there's an English teacher coming through again. But the Bible clearly identifies itself according to these two things. So, these symbols now serve the purpose of helping us understand what the Bible actually is, what the purpose of the Bible actually is as well. So let's look at some of these symbols. Now firstly, the Bible is considered to be a mirror. In James chapter 1, verses 23 to 25. So you see, as a mirror, the Word of God perfectly reflects the mind of God, but also the condition of man. So you see, when you look in this Word, it being a mirror, you see the person responsible for all your sin is yourself. But you also at the same time see clearly that God's word leads you to Jesus who has died for your sins 
and has saved you. We also call the Bible a seed, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. And when the word is pl properly planted in your heart, then you will grow. Your life will be enriched. You will grow in your knowledge and understanding. It will bring all that growth and it will bring fruit. Also, the Bible is called water. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 to 27. So you see, as water, the Bible has the power to cleanse and to quench and also to refresh. It is also called a lamp. Psalm 119, verses 105 and Proverbs 6, verse 23. You see, the word is a lamp because it shows us where we are, but it also guides us into the future and our life with God and it keeps us from falling. But it is also called a sword. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. You see, it's called a sword because the Bible has the ability to pierce the heart, to really make you see inside yourself and see where you went wrong and what may be wrong. It has that ability, and it's effective on sinners, on saints, and it's even effective on Satan himself. But then the Bible is also referred to as precious metals. It's called gold, Psalm 19, verse 10, and also silver, Psalm 119, verse 127. You see, the Bible is called gold and silver, precious metals, because the Bible is valuable and precious. It's very precious, and it has high value. But the Bible is also called food. Job chapter 23, verse 12. You see, the word is called food because it strengthens us. It feeds us. It leads us. It guides us. It is a nourishment we really need. Jesus himself said, man cannot live on bread alone, but from every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So his word is precious. It is our, it is our food. In verse 17, we read how it equipped Timothy and how it equips people. Let me just repeat that verse. So in verse 17, we read, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Now, in other translations, the word equipped is oftentimes translated as furnished or furnished. Now that means to be finished, to be complete. So it's in the passive voice. In other words, the completing ministry of the word is something that is done to the one who gets into the word. So if you will feed on the Bible, then you will grow. So if you make the Bible your food, then you will truly grow in your faith, knowledge, and understanding of Christ. But then, the word is also called milk. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. So as milk, it nourishes the young. So the Bible nourishes the young in faith, and as they grow in their faith, the Bible, the exact same word, then becomes meat. So it starts out as milk, then it becomes meat. You see, meat nourishes the more mature saints. And then, from there, you can also call it bread, because it can nourish everyone. It can nourish everyone. And also, it is called honey, Psalm 19, verse 10. It's honey because it is sweet, and it provides strength for the journey. But also, it's referred to as a hammer. Jeremiah 23, verse 29 it's a hammer because it possesses the ability to both tear down, but also to build up. And then finally, it is called fire. Jeremiah 20 verse 9. You see, it's called fire because it has the power to judge, purify, and consume. So these are just some of the symbols that is used for the Bible, for the Word of God. Now, thank God for the Bible. You see, God has blessed us beyond our ability to comprehend because we actually have the Bible. He has given us an inspired, infallible, inerrant, perfect, and you see the list can go on and on and on and on. With all the words, like I said, we don't have the vocabulary to just describe God and His awesomeness. He's just awesome. That is it. You see, may we take the Bible, this blessed old book, and read it, and love it, and spend time in it, and meditate on it, and really live it out. Let us be the people who are not just hearing the word, but actually become the doers of the word. 
The people will take the knowledge of the word and share it without shame or guilt or fear because how amazing is God? Isn't it news to just shout out and share and want to give to people and share the word of God with them? Because it's just an amazing book and it's a book about an amazing God who actually loves not so amazing people. But it's just that awesome. And you see, once we get into the word more and more, it will develop us, it will help us grow, it will feed us, it will nourish us, and we will become the men and women that God has made us to be and that He desires us to be. And you see, His word is going to lead us and teach us all the way to our home in heaven. We all have an awesome and blessed week.